Good evening, and thank you for participating in the colorectal cancer, what's new, and what's on the horizon webinar. There are two ways to participate in this webinar, and I'll go over both instructions for you now. Participants who have logged in on the webinar will be able to view the speaker's slideshow presentation and listen through streaming audio, as well as submit questions for the speaker by typing your question in the box titled, Submit a Question. Participants who have called in to listen to the webinar on the phone will immediately be placed into listen-only status and can submit a question for the speaker by pressing the star, then the one key on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. All questions submitted will be reviewed by the Colon Cancer, excuse me, Colon Cancer Alliance before put into the queue for the speakers to answer. Due to the time constraints, the speaker may not be able to address all the questions submitted. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, you may submit any technical questions in the submit a question area for operator assistance. If you call to listen to the webinar over the phone, please press star zero on your touchtone phone to request operator assistance. Please note this program is being recorded. I would like to now turn the webinar over to the Colon Cancer Alliance. Please go ahead. Good evening, and welcome to the Colon Rectal Cancer What's New and What's on the Horizon webinar presented by the Colon Cancer Alliance in partnership with Fight Colorectal Cancer. My name is Miguel Velez, the Colon Cancer Alliance Patient Support and Hispanic Outreach Senior Coordinator and your moderator this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to an upcoming national conference which will be held in Miami, Florida, October 11th and 12th. Whatever you're ready to tackle, whether it's your treatment plan, your community, your insurance company, or the federal government at large, we have put together an incredible agenda that is going to get you ready to take action, and I hope you'll be able to join us. To learn more about the conference or to register, please call our toll-free helpline at 1-877-422-2030 or visit our website at www.ccalliance.org. I'd like to now uh, introduce Randy, Randy Henninger, our Colon Cancer Alliance Helpline, Helpline staff. We'll tell you more about our programs. Randy? Thank you, Miguel, and welcome, everybody. My name is Randy Henniger, and I'm one of the helpline support staff here at Colon Cancer Alliance. We're one of the oldest colon cancer nonprofit support organizations in the nation. We were founded in 1999 and have grown to be one of the largest uh, support organizations for colon cancer patients, survivors, family members, and caregivers. Our programs include uh, and a helpline staffed by survivors Monday through Friday from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We also offer a large online community called My CCA Support, available at www.myccasupport.org. With over 3,000 members, the support community provides information and support for newly diagnosed patients, long-term survivors, caregivers, and family members. In addition, we provide one of the few financial assistance programs uh, available today for those that are currently in treatment for colorectal cancer called the Blue Note Fund. More information and applications can be submitted at www.bluenotefund.org. In addition, we have community outreach and local activities, including our Undy 5000 5K run walks in over 20 cities nationwide, raising millions of dollars for colon cancer screening and awareness. In addition, we provide uh, information and support for advocacy at the local, state, and federal level, and um, provide as well information and resources all vetted by medical professionals at our website at www.ccalliance.org. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share this information with you, and I do hope that you'll call and I get a chance to speak with you on our helpline at 877-422-2030. Thank you. Back to you, Michael. Great. Miguel. Thank you, Randy. Um, I'd like to now give Kim Ryan with Fight Colorectal Cancer, our partner in tonight's webinar, an opportunity to welcome you. Go ahead, Kim. 
Okay, thanks so much, Miguel. Well, first of all, I'd like to say a special thank you to both Miguel and CCA for the opportunity not only to partner together with them on this important webinar topic, but for really allowing me just a, a couple brief minutes to introduce our organization of Fight Colorectal Cancer to you. Um, our, our mission is listed there. I, I won't read it to you, but I would draw your attention to probably three words within it, and um, those words would be patience, policy, and research, as those are really the three main focuses of fight colorectal cancer. One area that I would like to highlight as it pertains to patients is our monthly patient webinar series, and this webinar tonight is actually a part of that series. Typically, our topics range anywhere from stage two treatment-making decisions to side effect management to treatment options for late-stage metastatic disease and kind of a mixed bag of everything in between. Um, they are all archived on our website, and you can visit Fight Colorectal Cancer's website that's listed there to, to learn more. Um, I would also encourage you to join our One Million Strong Awareness Campaign. It was really inspired by the over one million colorectal cancer survivors in the U.S. alone. And we are, in fact, a community of One Million Strong and, and both united um, behind a cure. So it's really a good place to go that you can share your story and show others that there is a support community of One Million Strong in this fight against uh, colorectal cancer. And then lastly, I would just invite each of you to join us um, in March of 2014 for our annual Call on Congress event. Uh, Call on Congress is our annual advocacy event that really includes an in-depth like, two-day advocacy training and then a third day of Hill visits where advocates can actually meet directly with their members of Congress. Um, the training sessions that are involved are really an opportunity for participants to develop um, congressional engagement skills, and then they're followed up by real and immediate action meetings directly with their elected officials. So it's really a terrific and empowering event, and you can learn more about it by visiting our website there at fightcolorectalcancer.org. And with that, I will turn it back over to Miguel and for the introduction of who I happen to think is a very wonderful speaker that we have tonight, Dr. John Marshall. So, Miguel, I'll turn it back over to you for um, Dr. Marshall's introduction. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. And, yes, again, I'd like to also thank Dr. Marshall for taking his time this evening. Um, Dr. John Marshall received his training at Duke University, the University of Louisville, and Georgetown University. He is an internationally recognized expert in, in new drug development for gastrointestinal GI cancer with expertise in phase one, two, and three trial design, and he served as principal investigator for more than 150 different clinical trials. He's widely published in the field of clinical oncology. He reviews manuscripts for eight different journals and holds peer-reviewed grants from the National Institutes of Health. While he has an interest in many areas of cancer research, his primary focus has been on the development of vaccines to treat cancer. Dr. Marshall has become an outspoken advocate for GI cancer patients and the importance of clinical research participation. Most recently, he has established the Otto J. Rusch Center for the Cure for GI Cancers, an organization solely focused on improving the lives of GI cancer patients through innovative research, personalized medicine, and focused advocacy. Dr. John Marshall? Miguel, my goodness, that was an awfully nice um, uh, uh, introduction, and I thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors tonight, Colon Cancer Alliance and Fight Colorectal Cancer, who've really gone uh, to the extreme to try and change uh, our world in GI cancers um, and establishing not only a firm foundation for us, a home for us to go to, if you will, and great information resources, but as you heard, raising money, donating that money, and helping support uh, an ever-growing community of patients with colorectal cancer. Um, that are out there, not only in the United States, we tend to focus on the United States numbers, but this is truly a global disease that um, together we will, we will work much better. Uh, and it's in fact most wonderful that we're uh, working together among different groups out there uh, in the world of colorectal cancer because it truly will be uh, a, a community uh, that changes uh, our world for colorectal cancer. My charge tonight was to, in fairly short order, no more than about 30, 40 minutes, review for you all the sort of state of the art of treatment of colorectal cancer, but also try and bring in some of the new data that's been brought forward over the last year uh, in colorectal cancer, uh, particularly stage four metastatic disease uh, will be our focus, 
because those are folks that, frankly, are in the most trouble. Um, those whose cancers have spread, who've grown in the liver or lungs, no fault of their own. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't um, uh, cause this to happen. They didn't eat too many Big Macs or not exercise or enough. I have plenty of marathon running, cardboard eating patients uh, in my clinic. Never did a thing wrong in their lives and still get this disease. Probably the best news I've got uh, for us tonight is that the mortality from colorectal cancer has fallen uh, in the last year, 2012. Uh, which is great news and may, in fact, be attributable to better screening and the like. Um, but what we are seeing is a shift to younger patients getting this. This was considered to be a disease of the over 50, but if you look at my clinic on any given day, the majority of patients increasingly are under the age of 50, 17-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, and 40-year-olds with this disease. And so we do need to change some of our thinking about when screening should come into play, and I hope you guys will ask some questions about that uh, as we go through. Um, but these are people who didn't do anything wrong in their lives and still end up with a fatal illness of metastatic colon cancer. It is these people that we need to uh, help the most and most urgently. And so that's really what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Before we get started, I think it's very important for us to review the sort of business or the stakeholders that are involved in the world of research and cancer medicine today. And I just give you this slide to kind of review for everybody where our world really is. And so at the beginning is the FDA, of course. They set the target for new drug development, and their metric is something called safety and efficacy. It's a target and I'm not all that happy with, and we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit later. All the patients on the phone know that the real controllers of our world are the payers. And CMS stands for Medicare um, or, or the other payers, private insurance. Their primary motivation is cost control and value. Um, we need to curb spending, if you will, uh, and cancer medicine is incredibly expensive um, uh, for patients uh, and their payers. Well, it's heartening to know that the National Cancer Institute and a group called CTEP, which is sort of the government's drug development group, their metric, their goal is to cure cancer. That's mine as well. Um, pharma, on the other hand, um, not evil. Um, they're an incredibly important partner in the process. They look at all of us as markets and return on investment. Um, and so without their investment, we'd be dead in the water. We would not be making any progress whatsoever. So we need to provide better markets, better return on investment for them uh, as a community. Almost 95% of patients in the United States today receive their care from a community oncologist. And their metric is efficient quality care. So they want a, an office that's run smoothly and well and efficiently um, and that patients feel like they are getting very effective uh, standard of care, and that's their metric. I, on the other hand, am an academic oncologist, and my metric primarily to my boss is clinical trial accrual. How many patients that I see actually enter into a clinical trial? Cancer centers are judged based on this, and I don't know if everybody out there on the phone knows that. To become a comprehensive cancer center, sort of the mecca of cancer centers, we're required to have a certain percentage of patients go on clinical trials. Um, and we do make that metric on a regular basis, but it is one of our uh, key elements. But no one really ever asks what patients want. Um, and so if, if there's no more important stakeholder than a patient, I don't know who it is, but time and again, no matter what situation the patient is in who I'm seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, their ultimate priority, their ultimate goal is to be cured. That's what they want. They don't want to live another six months. They don't want to live another year, although that's better than not living another six months or a year. They really want to be cured. Now, some patients will understand that, you know, we're not going to get out of this alive, um, and so they do come to the table with personal benefit as a reason to participate in clinical trials or even altruism, um, but really fundamentally I think most folks come to us looking for a better answer than the one we're giving. Now let's drill down a little bit 
on GI cancers as a field because I'm not just a colorectal cancer doctor. I take care of every cancer that's on this list. And if you bundle them all together, they represent the largest number, the highest frequency of cancers on the globe. And they are also, I'm sad to report, among the most fatal. And so while we are talking about colon cancer tonight and supported by colon cancer groups, on Saturday of this past week, I gave a talk and did a 5K for pancreas cancer. Now, don't get mad at me because I take care of pancreas cancer patients too. And I don't go to colon cancer meetings. I go to GI cancer meetings. And so as many of our sponsors tonight know, what I am hoping is that more and more we bundle ourselves under a larger umbrella. We all recognize the most successful advocacy group on the planet uh, for cancer is the breast cancer group. But the second most effective group uh, is, in fact, the leukemia and lymphoma group. And we must recognize that that represents over 150 different diseases, but it's one bicycle ride and one focused advocacy group, and it's been quite successful. And so one of my, I don't know, angles on all of this is to encourage us, uh, yes, to unify under a colon cancer umbrella, but also to... Uh, work with our partners in the other GI tract cancers, and I think together we have a much better chance um, uh, for uh, advocacy. Now, everyone on the phone knows that we live in a breast cancer nation. Those of us who don't have breast cancer or who don't take care of breast cancer day in and day out, when we see the pink ribbon, when we see um, the Washington Redskins turn pink for the month of October, when we see the race for the cure, yeah, on a certain level, we're happy about that. Um, but on another level, you know, it sort of makes us all angry that all of this attention is going to this one disease. Um, and it really has created a dramatic imbalance of funding for us out there. Um, I'll just use as an example that in the Department of Defense, the Pentagon's budget, there is over $100 million set aside this year for breast cancer research. Now, on one level, I'm happy about that. Research for cancer is good. I'd personally rather spend it uh, on uh, cancer research than on uh, another plane or another war. But $100 million for breast cancer, $10 million for everybody else. And when you recognize that imbalance, I don't know why we're not all charging down Pennsylvania Avenue in saying we want a more balanced approach uh, to our federal government's investment into cancer research. If one Googles, if you're bored with my talk, Google, you know, colon cancer clinical research funding, um, and you will find very few sources uh, to tap into to do research in colorectal cancer. If you do the same for breast cancer, you find pages and pages and pages of, oper of funding sources that are out there to fund their disease. Now, I'm not against it, as I said, but there just needs to be more balance. So everyone on the phone I know knows that the correct color for the colon cancer ribbon is, in fact, blue. But those of you who know me know that I really want the ribbon to be brown. I want it to go as far as being a smelly brown ribbon, scratch and sniff if we have to, um, if that's what it's going to take to get the attention uh, of folks. 150,000 people every year in the United States are going to get diagnosed with this disease, over 1 million worldwide, and about a third of all of those patients are going to have metastatic disease, and most of those will unfortunately die of their cancers. It's a major public health problem. Many more people die of colon cancer than breast cancer. We need to balance this out a bit. So off of my political soapbox, and uh, let's do a little science, because that's why you've got a doctor on the phone, a no copay doctor, by the way, so you can use that later in the talk. Um, so the way we all learned that colon cancer occurs is what's depicted on this uh, image here that you start from a polyp, a fairly benign thing that lots of us have, and over 5 to 15 years, these polyps get additional mutations that occur and, in fact, result in ultimately colon cancer. Our screening techniques are based on this theory that this is how colon cancer happens, that we only need colonoscopies every 5 to 10 years, 
in the routine population. Well, it's turned out that this may not really describe accurately the way colon cancer happens. So if we were right, the patients with metastatic disease and the drugs that work in stage 4 colon cancer would work even better in stage 2 and 3 cancers because they would just be kissing cousins of each other, and so the drugs would, should, should work in those uh, diseases or those stages. But in point of fact, that's not the way it's happened in colon cancer. So even though we've thought about this in a methodical way, and a lot of good science led us to this, it's not what's playing out there in the clinic and in the field. And so we need a different perspective on this disease. Part of our problem is that we have been using the tool that this man invented to make most of the diagnoses today. This guy invented the microscope, and there is a picture of him and his microscope. He invented it not because of cells. He hadn't even invented cells yet. Um, uh, he invented it because he wanted to measure the, how well a cloth was made, what was the weave count, if you will, a bed, bath, and beyond metric of the quality of cloth for Dutch traders to know what to charge and put in the bottom of the ship and send out there. But we basically use the same tool that this guy invented to make diagnoses in colorectal cancer. In other diseases, such as breast cancer and lung cancer and many others, we don't stop at a microscope. We do what's called molecular profiling of the cancer um, and not only look at it from a very high view, uh, but look at it down at the gene level. And that's clearly where we need to go in colorectal cancer. So I fly a bit too much. In fact, today I flew to Cleveland and back. Um, but And it was beautiful there, um, despite the talk about the weather in Cleveland. It was beautiful today there. Um, and, you know, you look out the window over the middle of the United States. It's a little like the view from this slide here. And it all looks the same, right? The middle of the United States is sort of flat. It's sort of partitioned. You can, if you really know your geography, you can find a river or two or a city or two. But this is a lot like what our pathologists are seeing. They're looking from way too far away and saying, okay, that looks like cancer under the microscope. What we really need to do is get down there on the ground and understand the, the, the politics, the local flavor of wherever we are flying over at the time and treat that tumor and not some generic tumor that we see from high up in the air. We are slowly shifting to that in colorectal cancer. Now, just to give you an overview of how I think when I see a, a new patient with metastatic colon cancer, the first thing I do is review their information, whether I'm the first oncologist or the third oncologist that they've seen, and say, how many metastases do they have? And where are those metastases? Because we've now recognized that some patients with colon cancer only have a few weeds in the garden. And if we can go and pull those weeds surgically or sometimes with radiation or other techniques, those patients will ultimately be cured of their disease. And this was unheard of when I first came out of my training and became an oncologist. You didn't go weed the garden because that was like weeding one's garden in March. You were going to have to do it again in April and again in May. But in colon cancer, one of our advantages is that some people only have a few metastases, and so they become resectable. And you can see that branch on the slime. And we have a lot of debate about whether those people should get chemotherapy or not or just have surgery. But for the most part, we do resections and we do uh, give some chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the majority of people fall into the right-hand side of the slime that are unresectable, too many weeds in the garden. No surgeon could go in and get them all out. And so we're stuck, if you will, using our medicines, which are helpful and have improved, but we're basically treating the yard on a regular basis to keep the cancers from spreading and growing. Sometimes we treat the yard, get lucky enough, and patients can then have surgery and are uh, transformed into fake folks who can have uh, resections. But this is how I think big picture uh, that I thought would be useful for you guys to see tonight. Well, we prayed for a long time for new drugs, and finally in the year 2000, some new drugs came out uh, of heaven. Manna fell from the sky, or in a TCAN comes uh, out as a chemotherapy drug, capecitabine or zolota, an oral chemotherapy, oxaliplatin, an IV chemotherapy, and the biologics, cetuximab, bevacizumab, and a new drug, penetumumab. 
and we moved the median survival of patients with metastatic colon cancer from about a year with 5-FU only to now closer to two to three years uh, for the average patient. Um, and that's using these new medicines. And we were so excited that in 2005, when heaven's door shut and no new medicines had come out, we didn't hear. Um, and in a lot of other cancers, what they were finding is new medicines that were actually making dramatic impacts. And our medicines were helping everybody a little. Their medicines and other diseases were helping some patients a whole lot. And we weren't finding the same result. Now, in 2008, we did find that mutations in this gene called KRAS, and I will come back and talk about that in a minute, were helpful. And in 2012, Heaven's Door spit out a couple of more drugs, aflibercept and regorafenib, that I can talk about later in the Q&A if you guys want. Well, how do oncologists do it? If you, go, if you have a community oncologist that you're going to see, he or she is taking care of all sorts of cancers, taking care of breast cancer and leukemias and bleeding problems and colon cancer and ovarian cancer. And how do they keep everything straight? Well, what we use to do this are what are called guidelines. And I've shown you an example of the European guidelines, which are frankly very similar to ours here in the United States. But I just love this slide so much, which is why I use it. It basically says that with all the drugs that we have, you can use them in almost any order, any combination, and any sequence. So there isn't really a unified standard around the world about how to play this chess game with our patients. What are the best treatments to use first, second, and third? Um, and we still don't know. And so we use a lot of interactive discussions with our patients to find out which toxicities do you want to avoid first? Do you want neuropathy? Do you want rash? Do you want to keep your hair? Do you want to lose your hair? What's your heart risk? And we take all of that into account and make a recommendation to patients and flow through this diagram of treatments, essentially giving all patients all the drugs, with the only exception around KRAS, as I said, I'll talk about now. So let's think a little bit about colon cancer. How many genes do you think are broken in a typical colon cancer? You know, nowadays we can measure all these genes. We can, we can do gene sequencing. We can do all sorts of fancy things on fairly small biopsies. There are some cancers that only have one broken gene. The most famous of that is called chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML. And we discovered that it only had one broken gene, and somebody was clever enough to make a medicine, a pill, called Gleevec, I'm sure you've heard of, um, which if you take this drug Gleevec, these patients with this terrible leukemia, well, they get better. The drug works wonderfully, and the side effects are minimal, um, and patients are almost cured of their disease, but they can certainly go for many, many years on this medicine, tolerating it well, and their cancer just basically goes away. But it's one broken gene, um, and, and it fixes it. Our problem in colorectal cancer is that we have 50 to 75 broken genes. Some people think more. And it's probably not the same broken genes among all the different patients that are out there. We hope there will be patterns of broken genes, but for the moment, we have uh, a bunch of different broken genes that can happen. And, and this view that I'm giving you here is a, a picture from a, a famous paper um, that actually looked at some of the pathways, some of the circuitry that's broken in cancer. Because remember, all cancer is is our normal cells where the genes have gotten out of whack. So it, the, the wires behind the walls are all there. They're all working and they're working fine, but in some cases the switches are broken. They're stuck in the on position or stuck in the off position. And so it's normal functions that are inappropriately being expressed. And this high-level view um, is a, a picture of all the different genes that may be broken. And I've circled one of them. It's called EGFR, or the Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor. It's one pathway that in a lot of colon cancer patients this is a switch that is stuck in the on position. And so the theory was if we could just make a medicine that interfered with this pathway, we would have benefit in colorectal cancer. And the famous drugs that are used for this is Herbitux and Panitumumab, both of which are approved. They're monoclonal antibodies that sit on this pathway and get the uh, switch to turn back off. 
And that was our belief, that if we just gave this medicine to everybody, it would work for everybody. But it wasn't quite so simple. If we drill down a little bit more on this pathway, um, and this is it. So the, at the top of it is outside the cell, and that little Y-shaped thing up there on the top is the receptor, it's sort of the antenna sensing for the cell what's going on out there in the world. And that's the switch that we need to sh shut off. And we can do that. Our antibodies sit on that switch and, and turn it off very nicely. But if you look inside the cell a little bit in sort of a, I don't know, slightly pink uh, color, you'll see a box that says RAS, R-A-S. And it turns out that about 40% of all colon cancer patients have a broken RAS gene, meaning the receptor, the switch, is fine. What's really broken is downstream, the wire behind the wall is stuck in the on position. So I could give all the antibody I want. I could mess with that switch all I wanted to, but in fact that switch, that signal, that pathway is going to keep driving this growth factor pathway. So the accelerator is stuck in the on position. The electricity is still going to flow to the light um, whether I use an antibody or not. And it took us a long time to figure that out uh, and move forward. But frankly, is it that simple there? Because we draw it like I've drawn it here on the left, sort of a, like a pool game. If I hit one ball, the other balls hit the other in exactly the way physics class taught us it would. But is cancer signaling like that, or is it much more like on the right-hand side, a sort of chaotic uh, signaling pathway? My daughter likes that I use her room as an analogy. That is basically a drawing of my daughter Emma's room. Um, which is so messy. My daughter is great. She's brilliant. She's smart. But a room is really messy. So, you know, what do we do as parents? We shut the door. We don't care. Let her room be messy. And that's a little bit what we've done in molecular biology is that chaotic network is too complicated for us to understand or to measure, if you will. And so we shut the door and we draw it the simple way. But which one is it? We did an, uh, there's, a, there's an analogy here that I want to use again. So in this spider web, the Gleevec medicine for chronic myelogenous leukemia is those scissors that are cutting that spider right at its web, right at its thread that it's hanging from. But when I give cetuximab or panitumumab to a patient with colon cancer, it's more like hitting that other strand, the upper one. And I don't even know if that's upsetting the integrity of that spider web or not because that spider web is using multiple signaling pathways. Sometimes I'll hit a very important driver pathway or a very important uh, a strand of the spider web, but a lot of times I won't. And so what we need to figure out is who's, which spider, if you will, is dependent on the web uh, that we're hitting and which one is not. So we did an experiment. Um, my boss here at Lombardi did that, a guy named Lou Weiner. And he took the receptor that we talked about and he stimulated it in the lab. And so uh, what he showed was not only do these receptors sort of realign, but when you measure everything that happened in the cell when you hit the receptor, lo and behold, 638 different genes move. And this is really dramatic. We hit one receptor, one pathway, and the entire cell reacts, if you will. And this is, of course, personalized medicine. And this is why it's so complicated and why we must work together. Because there will be patterns, but we will only find the patterns if everyone is all in on this and we all collaborate together to pick apart the different kinds of colon cancer that are out there. So no longer are we measuring just EGFR receptors or even KRAS. Now at this ASCO, we learned more and more that it matters all the different pathways that are involved, not just measuring one street corner to understand the traffic. You have to measure the entire way home so that you get a good sense of what's going on. And so we were measuring only one street corner and saying we understood how long it was going to take us to get home on a Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. In point of fact, we need to know multiple street corners, and they will be different on different days and different patients. And this is the challenge that's ahead of us. Our current standard, I want to shift a little bit to some ASCO data and then get, you, get us to some Q&A sessions. 
should we keep giving all the patients all the drugs? Should we pile them on? Um, is that the best way to go? Well, we started with the answer being yes, and that's from an important uh, analysis that my good friend Axel Grothy from the Mayo Clinic did, where he showed that the more patients that got more different kinds of chemotherapy lived longer. So those of you out there who are colon cancer patients who've gotten arenatecan and then oxaliplatin and then avastin and then the different medicines, the tuximab and the like, you got them because of this paper uh, that Axel published that said the more we give you guys, the better you do in the long run. Well, what about piling them on all up front? And this was a study presented just a couple of weeks ago in Chicago uh, at the cancer meetings where half the patients just got full theory, which is 5-FU and arenatecan, plus bevacizumab, which is also known as Avastin, or the other half of patients got a four-drug cocktail, 5-FU, oxaliplatin, and arenatecan, and bevacizumab. Um, and this was known as the TRIBE study, um, and half the patients got four and half the patients got three. Now, getting four drugs was more toxic, and you can see on this slide that there was more drop in blood counts. That's called neutropenia, more diarrhea. Um, and uh, more admissions to the hospital for fever and neutropenia in the patients who got four drugs over three. So it was a spicier meatball uh, for sure. But there were more patients that had a nice tumor shrinkage. So 53% of patients had tumor shrinkage on the three-drug cocktail. 65% had tumor shrinkage on the four-drug cocktail. And here are the curves, what are called progression-free survival, meaning how long did you stay on the treatment before your cancer grew? And the red line is the four-drug cocktail, and the blue line is the three-drug cocktail. And so you can see out there to the side is that the four-drug cocktail stayed on the first treatment strategy for 12 months. The three-drug cocktail stayed on it for nine months. Well, that's fine, but did it have an impact in what we call overall survival, meaning uh, if, do I just pile it on right from the beginning, or do I, in fact, spread it out more gently over time? And these are the overall survival endpoints, and they are not statistically different, although the red line does track, the four-drug cocktail does track a little higher than the three-drug cocktail. So there's a suggestion that piling on may be a good idea, but the overall benefit of that wasn't great. So would you put up with more toxicity right from the beginning, for a very small difference in overall survival uh, in the end, um, and that's what we got to figure out uh, for our patients and for each other. Now, I want to throw one more thing out there at you, and that's another uh, issue about how we do business in cancer medicine. We know we're trying to get away from just using a microscope, and we're using more and more gene profiling. There are a lot of gene profile tests out there, and I'd be happy to take some questions about the various products that are out there that people are using in stage two, three, and now four colon cancer to understand better about the sort of heart and soul of these tumors. But I think we need to be careful when we think about what tumor we're analyzing um, because many of you all on the phone or your, your loved ones have had surgery for their cancer. And while they were in the operating room, if you had a stopwatch, and as soon as the surgeon uh, cut off the blood supply, what we fancily call cross-clamping the artery, to the tumor, hit your stopwatch. If it took more than 15 minutes for that tumor to be fixed or preserved, then many of the genes have changed because that tumor is suffering from low oxygen. And so the cells are reacting to that. And this is just an example of one target, a cancer target, that doesn't change because there's something different about the cancer. It changed because of ischemia or low blood supply uh, to it. So when we do big operations, which very commonly are done in GI cancers, we almost never make the 15-minute mark. And so many of the proteins and, and RNA tests that we do uh, and we go back to the original tumor from a year or two ago, haven't been controlled for this ischemia time. And so we may be looking at the wrong thing, um, and maybe we should be doing more biopsies and more fresh tissue analysis so we can move this forward 
and understand better the tumor we're treating and not some tumor from a couple of years ago that wasn't controlled in a nice way. So colon cancer is becoming more than one disease. And just to give you a very high-level look, we know now that we, and we at Georgetown and many other centers, we test everybody for KRAS. Is your KRAS broken or is it intact? We also test for something called microsatellite instability, which is an inherited uh, process, can be acquired as well, but also sorts patients uh, into different molecular profiles. And there will be more. Some of the data that's emerged over the last couple of years at ASCO is that there may be five or six groups of colon cancer. And once we start to sort all of us into those different groups, we will get smarter. We will have uh, better outcomes for our patients. And I want to conclude on some things that we are working on at the Rouge Center and others around the world are working on to try and change. And frankly, I'd love to hear some of your feedback on this kind of approach. So right now what happens is I got a new patient with colon cancer. I use a microscope and I basically follow those guidelines, giving patients drugs, not so much based on their molecular profile, but based on preferences and my own biases that I bring to the table. What if we instead biopsied everybody and assigned patients under this master pro protocol using molecular profiling to different treatments? Um, some of these treatments, of course, would be standard treatments. Some of these treatments would be research treatments. Some people will opt out, and over on the right-hand side of this curve, you can see those folks who continue to opt for a standard of care approach but they, too, would be part of our science. They, too, would be part of our research because their experience under standard of care would also be tracked. And right now, the 97% of patients who do not go on to clinical trials, their data basically is lost. They're not added to the haystack in any meaningful way so that we can ultimately find the needles. And I don't know what folks on the line think about uh, the Affordable Care Act known as Obamacare, but one of the amazing things it will do for us in cancer is help us link all of our electronic data. Your doctor turns around and instead of writing in a chart, is typing into a computer. Well, we need to link all of those computers so that we can build a big enough haystack and understand the different profiles that patients have in metastatic colon. And so we are at the Rouge Center and others trying to link ourselves globally, not just here in the United States, with folks around the world who are interested in this kind of approach. Just to give you a bit of my perspective, um, there are 7 billion people in the world, and only 1 billion of these people have access to what we, you and I would call modern cancer care. So we need to reach out to these folks, uh, engage them, offer them cancer care as well. And in fact, I believe this will lower our own costs, build a bigger haystack, and allow us to move forward more rapidly. I mentioned earlier the concept of safety and efficacy, and I do want to poke a little bit because I'm hoping you folks on their phone are a bit of an advocate uh, for this idea. You know, we develop new medicines, and they're extremely expensive, and they only help a little bit in many cases. And that's because the FDA approves drugs based on safety and efficacy. They don't have to win by a lot. They just have to win by a little, whereas CMS, Medicare, and payers are basically not supposed to value medicines based on how well they work. They just need to find the money to pay for them if the FDA has approved. So our idea is to try and bring this together. Like every other country in the world, they not only assess the, the magnitude of benefit of a new treatment, they also assess its cost and determine whether or not it's worth it. I always say to myself, would I swipe my own Visa card for that therapy? And that's a really good acid test for whether or not a medicine has the right value coming into the marketplace. And the only way we will get this is if we work together and sort of push our systems to deliver this kind of value outcome. Um, if we find the right patient for the right drug, the drug can still be expensive, but the magnitude of benefit will be much greater, and it will be worth it for us to use those medicines. So I do believe we can come together. I know I come from Washington, D.C., and you don't think we do listen to each other, but actually lately I think they're starting to listen to each other. But we also have to respect what we hear. 
Um, and that's hard for some people, to, to hear somebody else's opinion that you're sure is wrong. But we have to listen to them and find the common threads, and together we can weave uh, a new fabric to provide not just better health care and cancer care for us and cures for GI cancers, but also on a global scale uh, as well. Now, it's a sort of pitch, but every year our Roosh Center here in Washington, D.C. throws a, a symposium that brings together not just docs and scientists, but patients and bioethicists and payers um, and the FDA and others. And this last year, we really tried to focus on why more people don't go on to clinical trials. Um, so 97% of Americans receive so-called standard of care, do not go on to clinical trials. And we wonder why do they, everybody line up to do that when we know that standard of care is not what we need it to be. And so we listened and we wrote down our high-level uh, results, and they're here. So first, we don't educate each other very well at all. So I'd be interested if anybody online has been on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, it's not a very easy website to use, even though it is the official website. And many, uh, probably CCA and everybody else, fight colon cancer, sends people to clinicaltrials.gov um, to find clinical trials. And it's, it's not very easy to navigate. So we need to do a better job of that. Secondly, there are no incentives for either physicians or patients to engage in clinical trials. It's really a lot of work for both patients and hospitals and docs to, to hold and, and host clinical trials and for patients to go on them. They actually uh, give quite a lot more than patients who are on standard. And, and, and we have no way of honoring those patients who, in fact, I see as the soldiers in the war on cancer. So we need to publicly recognize our patients who've enrolled on clinical trials um, and acknowledge them and their families for what they are contributing to uh, this uh, really terrible uh, set of diseases. Um, we need to quit doing studies that only are going to improve things by small amounts. Steps are good, but we can no longer afford very small steps with very expensive medicines. And I believe we must also, as I said, embrace the emerging markets. So we are in cancer care. This is really an insider's look as to where we are um, in our world today of health care, of cancer medicines, of science, of costs, and all of that. We're in between yesterday and tomorrow. We are in a bit of limbo, and it makes everyone unsettled, uh, docs, patients, everyone. Our old model was the more tests, the more drugs we give, the more scans, the more money we would make. And that's going to change to outcomes. The better we do, the better our patients do, uh, will in fact be incentivized. You may know this in your own world. We're shifting from docs and individual small practices to being bought out by healthcare systems. It's clearly happening. Right now, cancer care is something for rich people. Soon it will be for all countries. We're shifting away from microscopes to gene profiling. We're shifting away from safety and efficacy as a metric for drug approval to something called value. We're going to quit doing great big randomized clinical trials. We're going to do smaller enriched studies where you have the right gene, the right patient, the right time, and the right drug. We're going to stop valuing 1.4 months of improved outcome and we're going to start looking for what we call substantial improvement, a new FDA target just uh, approved. We're going to shift from what we call quality of life to letting you tell us how you're doing. Patient-reported outcomes are going to be the new metric. Patients as a subject, we're going to change that language completely, and our relationship to you being patients as our partner in the war on cancer. We're going to standardize our data collection and ultimately, we're going to lead to global drug approvals. Our challenge together is to not just complain about our current uh, situation, but it's our job to make the doctor-patient relationship on this slide 20 to 30 years from now better than the one we have it today, with our ultimate goal, of course, as we started from our discussion at the beginning, is to cure colorectal cancer. And with that, I thank you, and I think we're ready to take any questions.
Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. <clears throat> we'll now begin the question and answer portion of the webinar. As a reminder, participants who have logged on to the webinar can submit questions for the speaker by typing their question in the box titled, Ask a Question. Participants who have called into the webinar can submit questions to the speaker by pressing star then 1 on your touchtone phone. To withdraw the question, please press star then 2. Due to time constraints, we may not be able to get to all the questions. I will be posting as many as possible on our online forum on the My CCASupport.org. The first question we have is, Dr. Marshall, would you be able to, I know you've covered quite a lot of information, would you be able to kind of reiterate two new drugs for colorectal cancer, two of the more cutting edge drugs? Well, I'm not sure I would equate them with cutting edge, but they are new. So there's a new drug called Zaltrap or a Flibercept. Um, and that is a drug that's very similar to bevacizumab. Um, it may be different in how it works, uh, but it got approval um, for what we call second-line uh, metastatic colon cancer this past year. And another drug, which is a pill medicine called regorafenib or Stevarga, also got approved for colorectal cancer. Um, it shows some mild improvement in outcome as well. Um, but it, it, I'm frankly excited about that drug because I think it will teach us some new biology about colon cancer because um, not everyone benefits from the Stavarga drug. Um, only about 45% of patients do. Um, not only, that's a good number, um, but um, uh, we need to figure out who those 45 are um, um, so that we're not giving all 100 patients a drug that has some toxicity and just give it to the patients who are likely to benefit. So we are excited about that. At ASCO this year, we did not see a great deal of new information about new medicines, although there are many new medicines coming through the pipeline. Um, so um, I don't have something that I think is going to pop was approved uh, by a year from now, um, but we are seeing a lot of positive action in the clinical trial setting with a lot of different medicines. Well, very good. Thank you. The, another question would be, is it, is it common for gene testing to be done for a patient to kind of help determine the best treatment plan, or is that still somewhat case-by-case uh, -case basis? It is case-by-case, -case, but I do think we are at the sort of uh, shift from doing gene profiling as research to doing gene profiling as practice. So our problem is, is that we can do the gene profile. That's not a problem. Does it adequately predict for how a patient will do is the other problem. So first off, at our center, we're doing new biopsies. We are not relying on um, older uh, tissue because the tumor I'm treating now probably doesn't have the same gene profile as the tumor that was removed, say, a year or two ago. Um, and there is new increasing evidence that these profiles are helping um, improve outcomes. So um, uh, we are uh, doing this at Lombardi. Many other centers are doing this as well. But we are dancing the line between research um, and um, uh, practice. Now, there are a couple of genes. The KRAS gene must be done before one considers the EGFR monoclonal antibodies. That's sort of a requirement. And microsatellite instability is a gene test that we do and most do routinely in stage two colon cancers to decide whether or not we should give chemotherapy to those patients. So there are two that we're doing routinely now. I put those in my slide. The other broad gene profilings uh, are, are coming. Oh, great. Thank you again. The next question would be, um, when should I consider a clinical trial? What would you recommend for, for someone that's thinking about doing a clinical trial? When would be the best time to, to start considering? So this, this is easy for me because it's always. Um, this is a supply and demand problem. Uh, many patients don't have the option. They're not presented clinical trials as an option. Um, but frankly, stage two, stage three, stage four, all patients 
um, uh, should expect some sort of clinical trial. And I, we hear this a lot, am I ready for a clinical trial? Well, that basically means you're content with the standard of care and you only want a clinical trial when you've exhausted the standard of care. So one of the things we're trying to promote is having better clinical trial options so that patients, uh, it becomes really a no-brainer to say, well, that's what I'll do. Um, and uh, creating an infrastructure that makes it more attractive. Look, I get it. If a patient's coming in and there's a standard option and the clinical trial is the standard option versus the standard option plus something else, um, and it's randomized and you're not guaranteed, but if you go in the trial, you have to go in more often, you have to skip work more often, this kind of thing, um, then that's kind of a hassle and you could see, well, maybe the, the benefit's not there, so I don't want to do it. So not only do we need better information for patients, but we need to design better clinical trials so that patients come in and say, that's worth doing. So that's where the partnership comes in on this. Um, and that's where, as we value and honor our participants in clinical trials, I believe it will create a greater demand and more pressure on me as a doctor to deliver that better clinical trial. Great. In the similar, I guess, theme of clinical trials, a uh, question had come in asking that you maybe discuss a little bit more about immunotherapy. Yeah. And I would kind of venture to think that that would also go into a little bit about what I had read in your in your in your bio at the very beginning, uh, vaccine trials and things. Have you seen much headway in the line of vaccine therapy or immunotherapy? Yeah, no, it's an extremely important and positive thing that we're seeing. So I pre I presented to you a very complicated tumor. It may change over time. Um, it may even learn. We don't know. Well, the immune system is an incredibly powerful thing if we can just get it started and turned on, and it too can learn. And so we've known for many years that we could stimulate uh, a person's immune system to recognize their cancer as foreign, and in some cases actually go after it. But unfortunately, that, that didn't last very long. Um, but just this past couple of years, everyone who's been reading their cancer journals and reading the New York Times recognizes that there were some new medicines that have just emerged, which the fancy term for them is called checkpoint inhibitors. So these are drugs that once the immune system gets turned on, if you then take a checkpoint inhibitor, it stays on. Um, and so um, combining this kind of approach with our vaccines um, may prove incredibly useful in colorectal cancer. And so our therapy learns as the cancer evolves. So while we've had some successes using immune therapy or vaccine therapy for colon cancers and other GI cancers, our excitement has increased recently because of these checkpoint inhibitors. So for example, there's a study right now at my shop where we are giving standard chemotherapy, full Fox Plus Bevacizumab, in addition, we are adding a checkpoint inhibitor uh, to that uh, treatment in the hopes that that will further drive an immune response and improve outcomes. So I, as last decade was a decade of what I'll call targeted therapies, I believe that this decade we've just entered is the decade of immune therapy, and we're pretty excited about it. Oh, very good. Thank you. I guess in a, a similar a similar topic, I saw a question just come in, very similar, but asking about nanotechnology. Is there anything in the lines of uh, nanotechnology or, or the like? Yeah, I think um, I, I always struggle with this a bit because what defines nanotechnology? Drugs in, in some ways are nanotechnology because they're small things that reach the uh, genes and proteins of cells. But what I think most people think of is, is devices or delivery tools that um, take advantage of size. And there's a lot going on in that field, um, uh, mostly in the delivery. So getting uh, some treatment to the cancer specifically, having it stick to that cancer, um, and so it doesn't have a lot of collateral damage. And there is a, a great deal of work, not just in colon cancer, but uh, on, on that uh, in, in a variety of ways. Now, 
there aren't very many clinical trials doing that at present. It is still mostly in the preclinical or laboratory setting, uh, but we are seeing more and more of that uh, emerge, um, uh, and I think we will continue to see that. Great. And uh, one question I can answer, the question just came in about how a person can go about looking into clinical trials, what is a good way to look into them. And I know, Dr. Marshall, you had mentioned clinicaltrials.gov, which is one way. Another is through a partner organization called Emerging Med. A lot of uh, cancer organizations partner with them for a variety of cancers, and we have partnered with them for uh, cl clinical trials specific, specifically looking at colorectal cancer. They have a screening matching service that you can call, and they can go over what clinical trials are available in your area and your current conditions and kind of help you find trials that you might be eligible for. You can call them at 1-866-278-0392. Uh, once again, that was 1-866-278-0392. That information is also available on, on our website uh, if you have any issues with that. Now, moving into a um, slightly different area with um, concepts of like tomotherapy or other treatment ideas for folks that are stage four um, or various stages, what would you consider usage for those type of treatments outside of the chemotherapy for maybe somebody that's on maintenance or um, they're kind of limited in the amount of options their doctors are, are looking at. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. You said tomotherapy. Yeah, that was one of the questions that came in. You mean like and, radiation? And yeah, I believe so. I think what her question is they're kind of feeling like they're, they're limited in the amount of options that they have left yeah. um, that the doctors are considering, and, and have you seen that yeah. used much? Yeah, so this is a common question. Um, you've used all the tools in the toolbox, and now what? And you're still feeling well. That's the good part about our patients with colon cancers. Many of them have, are still doing fairly well. Radiation, I'll just sort of say uh, high level, um, is a good way to zap tumors but you can't radiate the entire body. So you, it's like surgery in the way that if you've got a, an area or a focal area that's causing you problems, radiation can be helpful. Um, but in stage four disease, that's generally where it's used. Now, more recently, there is a way of, I don't know, combining nanotechnology and radiation where there's something called sear spheres or therospheres where these things are injected into the liver and the little beads are, have radiation in them, and they hang up in the tumors and cause uh, the, the tumors to get radiated using that kind of delivery. So that's nanotechnology delivering radiation. And that's often done in patients with predominantly liver metastases. Um, patients with wider spread metastases, you know, lung metastases, bone, liver, other areas, um, you know, there aren't you know, once you've used all the standard medicines uh, that are approved, and regorafenib, a flibriceptor, some of the newer ones of those medicines, um, there really isn't. And I, 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 you know, outside of clinical trials, so those are patients who might seek a early phase two or phase one clinical trial um, to try some of the new medicines. Those are patients we sometimes do gene profiling on to see if that will guide us into sort of smarter chemotherapy choices for our patients. Because frankly, when we just throw chemo at patients, um, it, it's really uh, an emotional move. It's almost certainly not going to help in terms of the cancer. It certainly will add side effects. And it really may in some ways hurt patients because if you have side effects and it doesn't help slow the cancer, then frankly it may shorten people's time. And so one of the things that we as doctors need to be better at is counseling patients around that. And one thing that patients need to know is that sometimes the right thing is to stop treatment um, and um, not pursue it just because you feel like you have to. You want to find something that will help or do the best you can to find something that will help, not just a security blanket of a few more rounds of chemo that in fact may hurt. So. Um, 
the patients who've tried all the medicines are still around and doing fine. Um, that is one of our most difficult discussions um, about whether to do trials, whether to do gene profiling, or whether, frankly, just to stop um, and um, uh, enjoy uh, life. Um, and those are those are different pe folks make different decisions, but they're they're appropriate decisions and discussions to have with your physician and your family. Great, uh, thank you again. Now, some of the questions are coming in about uh, the children of folks that have been diagnosed. One of the questions is a little bit more general, um, being diagnosed uh, stage four in their 50s. Uh, when would you recommend their children being screened? So first off, nowadays we are doing more and more gene testing to understand if patients have the most common inherited syndrome known as Lynch syndrome, or HNPCC. And this is about 5 to 6% of all colon cancer, so it's pretty common. I have many patients with this gene deficiency. Think of it as sort of the Angelina Jolie for us. Um, uh, so a very strong family history, the right gene being broken, um, and a very high risk of folks in the family having cancer. So in those families, there are very specific recommendations for when uh, folks should get gene tested and how to handle that screening. For a patient who does not have that gene, um, the Lynch genes, um, and they just have what we call sporadic, uninherited colon cancer, we still think that you know the, the, the offspring should probably be tested at a younger age. Um, because there may be something running in the family that we simply don't know the name of or characterized. So the book says 10 years before the, uh, the youngest member of the family, so somebody at 50, then kids at 40. Um, but as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we're seeing more and more younger folks with this disease. Um, and so I wonder if we should start looking at... Uh, a different screening. We think that colonoscopy is the gold standard, but more and more we're recognizing that that has its drawbacks and costs too. And as more and more folks are working on uh, gene testing for stool, there's a urine test being developed and others, that maybe we'll have a, a better screening test for colon that we can apply to younger patients. So the specific answer to the question 10 years before the youngest member of the family with cancer um, but making sure you don't have the familial gene, and hopefully we'll, by the time the kids get to that age, we'll have better screening. Wonderful. Um, kind of moving into a, a slightly different genre here. I see quite a few different questions coming in. Um, can you talk about a little bit as far as the latest research with vitamin D and even calcium in preventing recurrence, or perhaps in uh, more general in as a preventative overall? Well, let me, let me um, I'll be glad to answer that, but I want to start with what may be a more important recommendation, and that is exercise. The data is fascinating that people who exercise a fair amount, what I always jokingly prescribe to my patients is a dog, um, just walking the dog for about 45 minutes a day is enough, but people who exercise have a reduced risk of recurrence, have been shown to have a reduced risk of developing cancer. And that's true for colon cancer, breast cancer, and others. Recent data suggesting it improves dementia risk, and we've always known it reduces heart and stroke risk. So, frankly, we should all be moving around more um, as a prevention. So, first, do that. Then if you want to do something else, um, there is um, some data around calcium and vitamin D. The calcium data is more controversial, less firm. The vitamin D data looks pretty good um, for prevention. And there's even data around COX-2, so aspirins and the Celebrexes of the world may in fact help prevent uh, colon cancer or recurrences of colon cancer. So what I tell all my patients who've had colon cancer is exercise, high fiber, low fat diet, calcium and vitamin D, uh, and a baby aspirin every day. Um, and frankly, other than the aspirin, most of us should be doing uh, the exercise and the high fiber, low fat. Um, calcium won't hurt, vitamin D probably helps. Great. Um, 
moving into the similar concept, a few questions have come in about uh, like superfoods. Specifically, there's been some talk with uh, shiitake mushrooms and different herbal extracts and things. Have you seen anything in clinical trials or any um, evidence backing behind such superfoods? No. That doesn't mean it's not out there, but I haven't seen it. Um, I actually recommend against this sort of approach in patients, and I believe sort of balanced diet is the right thing. We have to remember that, you know, I don't think people are going to eat their way out of this or um, they're going to, you know, people who, you know, never done anything wrong with in their lives still end up getting colorectal cancer. So, um, you know, th might there be something to it in an occasional patient? Yes. Um, might it be a placebo effect, meaning that if you believe it will help, it will, yeah. Um, and may it be somewhere in between some truth and some placebo? Sure. So uh, I get this question multiple times every day in clinic about what to eat, what to do, how to live, and I'll simply say maybe because I don't know any better, uh, balanced diet, keep moving, keep your head up, always have a plane ticket. Wonderful. Thank you. Is there anything else you might add to the nutrition concept as far as um, folks going through treatment? I know some folks have kind of heard about antioxidants being good, some saying bad because they also protect the tumor uh, and, and cancer sites. Is there any kind of uh, in the nugget uh, do's and don'ts as far as the no, I'll try to be quick. So I generally don't I recommend against high-dose antioxidants because they do interfere with chemotherapy. Um, anything more than a multivitamin, generally you're not keeping on board anyway. You're peeing out. Um, and even most of the multivitamin you're peeing out. So um, I tend, again, balanced diet, keep moving, head up. Great. Someone had asked about uh, their gene profiling after chemotherapy and radiation. Have you seen anything as far as folks that have gone through a great deal of treatments and the gene profiling be, being off, basically, if they're looking into to clinical trials or anything after the fact? Well, so as I said, what we're doing in patients who've had some treatment and are now thinking about it is we're, not, we're doing new biopsies and new analysis. So we're not relying on the old uh, tumor um, to predict what we should do next. In some cases, that's the right answer. It may not be important in all cases. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's a great question. Um, there's not clear answers on it. It's still sort of research. But I think it's the kind of thing that we keep pushing on. Um, it'll yield some answers. Great. There's been some questions here about uh, Zaltrap being approved a year ago. Uh, is there any new data being collected on, on the drug itself? Or, or yes, it's being, it's being tested in additional clinical trials. Um, but um, for now, I don't know of new studies um, that are presenting. Um, but um, it's a useful drug. Um, behaves very much like bevacizumab in the clinic so far. And the question will be, in the end, does it behave differently, um, better or worse, uh, than the existing drug? So it's not dramatic innovation for us, but it gives us another option. Wonderful. Thank you. There's uh, one more question I think we have time for here. We could say, um, what is your opinion on Folfox plus Avastin in the treatment of metastatic uh, cancer with uh, lymph node involvement? Have you seen that as being... So I'm assuming that's a stage two or three, sorry, stage three, so not metastatic or? That's, was, it, was it they had written metastatic with lymph node involvement, so I, so I think you're probably. Well, if, it, if, if it's stage three, the test has been done and Avastin really didn't do anything in that setting. Uh, but stage four, absolutely, I think it's a drug that uh, is very often used and it's been shown to have some improvement in outcomes. Um, uh, the um, what's the right base recipe, that kind of thing is always in debate, but it's certainly a standard approach about uh, the majority of the world uses 5-FU, either oxaliplatin or arenatecan, and bevacizumab as initial therapy. Um, uh, that's what most guidelines suggest. So it's a pretty standard uh, choice. 
Wonderful. Is there any other research you've seen from kind of around the world that seems to be um, new or up and coming? I know the U.S. is often looked to, I guess you could say, uh, as a primary source of knowledge. Have you seen anything in trials overseas uh, in Asia or Europe or anywhere? We are really quite a small community, frankly. And so the GI oncologists of the world, not just colorectal oncologists, but GI oncologists, know each other quite well. Um, and we share our data. We go to our same meetings. And so I think what you're seeing, the, the trial I presented was, in fact, a European study. So, um, uh, no, I don't think there is um, something hiding out there, if that's what uh, the, the question is, that, that we're not seeing, because a, a lot of the research is being done in Europe and shared with us. Wonderful. And as far as like a, a standard of care, a basic standard of care with someone that's in stage four, uh, receiving chemotherapy, and it seems to be kind of stable, uh, holding its own, is it pretty normal to, to keep going in that course of treatment until something else maybe comes along? Or uh, assuming this would probably more depend on the individual and it's a case-by-case -case basis, but would you be able to elaborate on Sure, it's a great question. So the concept that we have is called maintenance therapy. Um, if you keep giving all the drugs, patients will just get worn out. It'll be too much. Um, so what we do is usually give a combination recipe for a while, you know, three months or so, and then back off um, and give just maybe a couple of the drugs um, that don't have the cumulative side effects. And there have been studies that show if you keep a little something going, the cancer stays quiet longer. Let me put it a different way that the medical uh, analogy. You know, if you were diagnosed with a brand new diagnosis of diabetes, it often takes a lot of insulin to get your initial diabetes under control. But if I keep giving a lot of insulin, I'll bump you off. I'll, give, I'll lower your sugars too much. And so after, an, same analogy, after an initial treatment with more intensive chemotherapy, backing off and giving, if you will, the right amount of chemotherapy um, may be the best strategy for our patients at the time. Wonderful. Well, I haven't seen any more questions coming in at the minute. Is there? We do have a, another minute more. Is there anything you'd like to, to add, Dr. Marshall? No, I just, uh, I, I, I'm very pleased that folks have, have spent the time. I hope this has been useful um, uh, for folks. I hope it's what they were looking for. Um, and if there are other questions, uh, I think you have a way that they can get a hold of me. Most definitely, most definitely. Again, our, our toll-free line, if you do have questions about anything related to, to colorectal cancer, uh, please do call us at 1-877-422-2030. Uh, again, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of Colon Cancer Alliance, I'd like to thank our speaker, uh, Dr. John Marshall, as well as Kim Ryan from Fight Colorectal Cancer for their participation. I, I would like to also reiterate um, what Dr. Marshall said, and I hope that everyone here has gotten some information uh, and really found some answers to what they were, they were looking for. And I encourage everyone to please continue our discussion here on our online forum on myccasupport.org. The uh, webinar will be posted within a couple of days online and uh, you can feel free to continue to submit questions. We'll answer those questions on our website on myccasupport.org. Shortly after you log off, you'll be receiving an email asking you to participate in a survey. We value your feedback. It's for us to be able to better our program and improve it in the future. You'll also be uh, entered to win a uh, gift certificate to Target. So do hope you all uh, give us some good feedback about the webinar. Thank you all very much, and have a good evening. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes tonight's conference. You may now disconnect.